we have two of the major developers of both the upstream and the midstream sections of what is more than 40 and probably closer to $50 billion worth of investment. We have the developer of what might be the next phase of serving energy requirements in the Balkans. We have a wealth of expertise, and I am astonished, I would normally say, of exhaustion from people who have been working on this for years and are now on the verge of actually turning, in the phrase of one of them, words into real steel pipe on the ground. The only point I'd like to make is that we very much regret that Rovdag, Rovnag Abdulayev, the president of SOCAR, was not able to make it at the last minute due to prior commitments that suddenly required his presence elsewhere. However, I think we can stress that if you want to take a look at how all of these projects are balanced, you find that there is a very rough equivalence. We do not know the exact precise costs of what it will take to develop the Shachtanese upstream, the expansion of the South Caucasus pipeline to Turkey, the TANAP project across Turkey, the TAP project that will take Azerbaijani gas to landfall in Italy. But if you take it as an approximate cost of somewhere between perhaps around 45 billion, and you work out the corporate shares in the various projects, it's quite striking. BP and Statoil and SOCAR are all in it for much the same value roughly a $10 billion investment. Total is in there for about $4 billion, and the two Turkish companies, Turkish Petroleum and Botash, between them are in there for about $4.5 billion. These are enormous sums, and they appear at first glance to be disproportionate to what is the volume that will initially be carried. Six BCM of gas to Turkey, 10 to Europe. But you don't build infrastructure just for the initial volumes. You have to think, what is the capacity? What will it carry in the long run? And then you face the problem that all three panelists face. How do you cover the gap between the initial volumes and the anticipated larger volumes in order to make sure that throughout the lifetime, and particularly the early years of the project, you are getting a commercial return for your very extensive upfront investment? So it's not an easy set of projects, but if you want to look at it, in a geostrategic sense, what you are doing is creating not simply a new corridor to carry gas to Europe and thus diversify European energy supplies. You're creating a new corridor that opens up the way for entirely new sources of gas to reach Europe. So that makes a major change in the way the European market is covered. And with that, I'll end my introductory remarks. Um, I have to say that um, this session is on the record. You can quote anything you want to. You can use the tweet system, hashtag AC Summit. Um, and without further ado, I think I will 
hand the floor over to Al for some introductory remarks, and we will try to keep them short in order to open it up to the floor. Al. Well, John, thanks very much, and I'd like to pick up on your comments on making Chardonnay's too a successful development in its own right, but also preparing for the future. I flew here yesterday on Turkish Airlines from Baku, and they serve a very nice, a very nice meal on board. They start with the, the Turkish meze, and I found that um, having eaten this large portion of Turkish meze, these appetizers, I was pretty full. And when we look at 2013 for the Southern Corridor, that is but the appetizer for the Southern Corridor, but the portion has been fairly large. <laughs> so what I'd like to start by doing is talking a little bit about what we've done through the appetizers for the Southern Corridor in, in 2013. I'd like to highlight three particular things. The first of them is actually very immediate, and that is that together with SOCA, we have agreed that we will increase production from the Chardonnay's field by around one BCMA over the next few months. That means that consumers in Azerbaijan, Georgia, and Turkey can enjoy increased gas supplies as we enter the cold winter period. The second thing I'd like to highlight is the selection we've made during 2013 of the TANAP and TAP pipelines to take our gas through Turkey and on into Europe. And that commitment to work with TANAP and TAP was enhanced a couple of months ago when we signed gas sales agreements for 10 billion cubic meters of, year, of gas a year to Europe um, through the, the TANAP and TAP pipelines in what is perhaps one of the largest gas deals of all time. Um, over $100 billion of gas contracts signed in one go for a period of 25 years. The third thing I'd, I'd like to highlight is the ongoing work we're doing with Bulgaria and other Southeast European countries to provide gas beyond TAP into Southeast Europe and into the Southern Corridor. And it's a real delight to have Harry Sakinis uh, of DEPA here uh, today as one of the key leaders of the pipeline project between Greece and, and Bulgaria. So if you like, that's the appetizers. Um, but as John said, we are rapidly approaching the main course, the development of Chardonnay's too. Just a few numbers for you. John mentioned the, the, the capex, the capital figures, certainly well in excess of $40 billion. The length of the pipelines, 3,500 kilometers. The countries involved, seven. The jobs created, over 30,000 construction jobs along the length of the pipeline. And the companies involved, 11 different companies involved in the projects from end to end. And I'd like to pick up on that because as we look to make a final investment decision on these four projects in the month of December, so just next month, we're going to have to ensure that this is a commercially compelling proposition for all 11 companies. And that is our, our big challenge to demonstrate that over the next few weeks. Now, as with many good Turkish meals, um, what you think is the main course turns out just to be another starter. And perhaps that's not a bad analogy for the Southern Corridor, where Chardonnay's, despite its size, might simply turn out to be yet another starter for the main course of the Southern Corridor. When we see fields in Azerbaijan, like ACG Deep, Chardonnay's Deep, Absheron, Shafa Gassiman, Umid, Babek, all huge potential gas fields in their own right, it's very important that we develop the Southern Corridor with the potential for a real main course in mind. The gas volumes from the Southern Corridor, uh, from Chardonnay's alone, can bring 16 billion cubic meters of gas a year through Turkey. That's enough gas to supply the capital cities of every country along the Southern Corridor. Azerbaijan, Georgia, Turkey, Greece, Albania, Italy, and Bulgaria. More than twice over. So that in itself is a hugely significant amount of gas supply. But our pipelines are being designed to be enabled to be expanded to be double their initial capacity. Every pipeline we're building 
has capacity double what we're going to use at the beginning. And that's because, unlike me having a Turkish meal, we don't want to be surprised if there's a, if there's a main course beyond the appetizers. And perhaps a way to finish would be simply to reflect on, on what that takes. Any wonderful meal is not best enjoyed by yourself and is best enjoyed with partners and with friends. And that concept of partnership is absolutely key to the development of the Southern Corridor. It's going to require partnerships between consumers and producers. It's going to be re requiring partnerships between countries and companies. And that, I think, is why debates such as the one today with a fellow pipeline operator here, Kietil Tungland, a consumer and another fellow pipeline operator here, Harry Sakinis, are so important. And why holding this summit in Istanbul, which will be uh, part of Turkey, the linchpin of the, the Southern Corridor, is, is such an appropriate place to have this discussion. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much for putting the context uh, Indeed, um, reminding us that uh, Turkey is the home of one of the world's three great cuisines. Um, I think one can possibly say that uh, the Southern Corridor project is probably the leading energy project in the entire world as a whole. Is there any bigger one at the moment? We've certainly uh, got the most complex project. <laughs> <laughs> a delicate meal indeed. Um, our next speaker is Harry Zakinis. Uh, would you like to take the story a little bit further? Yes. Uh, I'm here presenting DEPA. DEPA is uh, the natural gas company in uh, Greece. Uh, and I have a dual role here. Uh, the first role is the role of a buyer of Sakhdenis gas. Uh, we are very pleased to have concluded an agreement to buy the gas uh, for uh, 25 years. Uh, we are already getting gas from a variety of sources. Um, our suppliers include uh, Gazprom, uh, Botas, we also get uh, LNG from Algeria, and we also procure spot cargos whenever we have the need uh, for uh, spot cargos of uh, LNG. But we believe uh, that uh, the gas uh, from Azerbaijan will enhance, uh, enhance our portfolio uh, and make it a competitive portfolio in the region, and that is something very important for us as we look at uh, the markets uh, around us. So we're very pleased to have uh, this cooperation with uh, the Shah Deniz uh, partners. Uh, th there is another thing that I should mention here about the relationships, and probably there's a third role here, uh, and uh, Rovnag Abdullayev is not here, but I should mention that uh, uh, right now, DESFA, uh, which is the pipeline company in Greece, is 100% owned by DEPA. Uh, and DESFA is the company that uh, is in the process of being acquired by SOCAR. Uh, so, SOCAR will have the control of uh, the pipeline company in Greece, and that is something that we expect uh, will be concluded uh, in uh, the middle of uh, next year. Uh, finally, and I think it is uh, uh, very important as well, uh, we are working uh, as a consortium uh, with uh, uh, Bulgarian Energy Holding and Edison uh, to build IGB. IGB is the interconnector between Greece and Bulgaria. Uh, it is a very effective way uh, to bring gas that comes uh, from or through Turkey uh, and uh, from Azerbaijan to bring it into the Balkans. Because this interconnector will connect us to the Bulgarian ring. From there, there are going to be connections to Serbia, uh, to Romania, from Romania connections uh, to Hungary, uh, so, obviously, all of these countries uh, that uh, didn't have a variety of sources that they could choose from uh, for their gas will have additional opportunities uh, through IGB. It is an effective and efficient way to bring gas because it is only a very small pipeline, 170 kilometers, at a cost of about 220 uh, million euros. Uh, which means that the cost is going to be very low compared to other alternatives and will have a capacity of between 3 to 5 BCM, according to the final need that we'll see developing, uh, to bring us uh, to the Balkans uh, and uh, beyond. Uh, so we're very pleased about uh, this development as well. Um, Southeastern Europe is going to be a very 
interesting place in the next several years. I think um, uh, Shah Deniz is lucky to be the first one to bring its gas to what is the closest market. Uh, there are going to be developments such as uh, offshore finds of gas in both Bulgaria and Romania. Uh, let's not forget that Romania is already producing indigenously about 80% of the gas that it uh, consumes. And then let's not forget uh, all the other developments uh, in the Caspian, uh, uh, more gas uh, from Azerbaijan. Let's not forget all the great developments that are happening in Iraq and uh, additional resources that could come from there. And finally, uh, also gas from Eastern Mediterranean that will find the way hopefully to the closest markets. Uh, and potentially uh, gas uh, from Greece, where we're currently doing uh, seismic uh, uh, research to see how much uh, gas exists and uh, exactly where. Uh, so th this it will be very interesting to see how the market develops uh, with all of these, uh, but uh, we're very happy to be in the middle of all of this in Greece. If you look at this through the interconnections, and Kieti will talk about uh, uh, TAP and uh, obviously the interconnections to Turkey and the IGB, Greece is going to be in the middle of a 170 billion cubic meter market if you include Turkey, uh, the Balkans, and Italy. So we're very pleased to be playing a key role in that market. Harry, thank you very much. Um, obviously, the anchor market for initial gas supplies is going to be Europe. And uh, it's Shell Tungland who's been working on the pipeline that will actually deliver that gas. Um, do you want to say how you think things are going to proceed in that way? Yeah. Well, it was an interesting point that Al made about the appetizers and main course. There's something probably I misunderstood here, because I thought the appetizer was all about this pipeline selection process, which was heavy enough, and that the uh, main cause was the, the first stage of uh, Shark Denis uh, 2 development. But then you didn't mention dessert, so I guess there's something more coming. <clears throat> um, I would like to highlight just a few points uh, that TAP has uh, done, or, since last time we met here in Istanbul. Um, <clears throat> I think it's been mentioned already that uh, the pipeline uh, TAP was selected in June. That sounds kind of uh, a one-off event, but for us, we had to work the whole um, first year in developing the uh, selection decision package, a 900-strong a package of documents that was a major undertaking and we are very happy with with the outcome of course following selection uh, we admitted four new shareholders into the partnership BP Total Suka and the Belgian company Fluxus and since then we have been busy preparing for the final investment decision scheduled to take place now before Christmas. So we have made everything complete. Uh, the front end engineering and design is completed. All contracts are agreed and signed. We enjoy very strong and dedicated support from all our governments. <clears throat> and so now we are just looking forward to having the final go because we are not out of the woods until Shaq Denise has made their final investment decision. So what is it that TAP can do in this respect? Well, <clears throat> we will transport the gas under Shaq Denise's sales agreements to Italy, accommodating supplies to Greece under Harris agreement, and also cooperating with IGB to supply Bulgarian customers. But that is then the main cause, as far as I'm concerned. The dessert is that TAP can be expanded, can double its capacity from 10 to 20. Now, that raises quite a number of interesting opportunities. 
As you know, when, when TAP enters Italy, Italy is very well connected with the rest of the European gas market. There are flows of gas coming from the north, from Germany, Switzerland, via Switzerland into Italy. And that flow can quite easily be redirected and be bidirectional. The Belgian company Flux is, is heavily involved in that. This company now being part of TAP really demonstrates how TAP is actually a European project, being able to serve the entire European continent. Harry also mentioned uh, the opportunities that this system represents for the Southeast European region. Connections northwards via Bulgaria, but also TAP has established quite close cooperation with the project called Ionian Adriatic Pipeline Project, crossing or start connecting with TAP in Albania and then going northwards via Montenegro, Bosnia, up to Croatia, connecting maybe even with Slovenia. These are opportunities that governments and companies in the region are now cooperating closely to make use of. But I think uh, a good starting point is the cooperation TAP has established with the Albanian government to make sure that Albania can be gasified and start doing so in the right sequence. What happens next for TAP is that we, uh, after the final FID, we'll start putting our feet on the ground to secure access to the land for the entire corridor. For us, that means making agreements with 23,000 landowners in Greece and Albania. We will start the uh, process of procuring goods and services. But there's one thing, and it's not a sort of a highlighted topic here in this conference, but there's a commitment which I find more important almost than everything. And that is the commitment TAP is making to construct this pipeline without harm to people, their assets, and the environment. We will, during construction, have 2,000 workers in Greece, 1,000 workers directly involved in construction in Albania. <clears throat> it is a major undertaking which we are committed to do in the safest possible way. My final point is picking up on what Al was saying, that this is a project involving seven nation states I think if you add uh, uh, to the number of companies involved, all the buyers involved, and all the companies involved in, in connecting pipeline system, I think you can arrive at the number of somewhere between 20 and 25 companies. And that's when you don't count the contractors that will actually be doing lots of the work. But the whole thing does not work until every piece of it works. And every piece of it won't work until the entirety works. And that just demonstrates the need for close cooperation, open, transparent, and tight among the companies, among the governments involved. And TAP is ready to commit to that cooperation. And I actually think we all need to wish each other good luck with that. Then. Thank, you. Thank you very much. Shall thank you. I'm going to open the questions up to the floor, but I'm going to use my privilege of asking um, a set of questions very quickly, which are, we are very close to final investment decisions, I presume, on Jacques Denis, on TAP. Um, do you want to uh, be any more precise as to when we can... Well... We've always said that we expect a final investment decision by the end of this year. So um, you, can, you can see for yourself that that leaves only a few more weeks to, to get to the right outcome. I think we are set up for that. 
and we're expecting to do that. Um, I'd highlight a couple of challenges um, that we need to resolve. Uh, firstly, around Chardonnay's stage two, where we simply need to get um, all the partners, the seven partners within Chardonnay's stage two, all to process the approvals for what is, in most cases, the biggest project in the history of their companies. And there are, as an example, uh, over 30 legal agreements that simply need to be signed by seven companies over the next four weeks to get us to that place. The second area I'd highlight is, is here in Turkey, where the development of Chardonnay's 2, the final investment decision of Chardonnay's 2, is dependent upon the final investment decision of the TANAP, the Trans-Anatolian Pipeline across Turkey. And here there's a key role for the TANAP shareholders um, in working together, uh, and that includes Botash as, as well as Sokar, as well as BP, uh, and potentially others. Uh, there's a key role for those pipeline owners in working to formalize the TANAP final investment decision and formalize the agreements between TANAP and Chardonnay's for gas transportation. So we're very confident that um, we're going to get to the right outcome uh, in December, um, but we also recognize that it's going to be a busy few weeks ahead as everything's finalized. Michelle, do you want to add anything regarding the TAP FID? Well, like um, I mentioned, we have ticked all the boxes, um, making ready for actually Shaq Denise's final investment decision, because our decision is contractually linked to theirs via gas transportation agreements and the cooperation agreements. Um, <clears throat> so actually, we are not out of the woods until Shaq Denise have made their final investment decision. Harry, do you want to come in? Absolutely. Sure. Uh, I, IGB has concluded all the environmental uh, impact assessment studies. Uh, we're very close to completing the, the front-end engineering design, and we're ready to take an FID in uh, the summer of 2014. The project is a much smaller project, so actually we expect to be able to transport gas through IGB uh, at the beginning of 2016, so before actually gas flows from Azerbaijan uh, towards Europe. So, and, and, and based on uh, the uh, uh, expressed interest for the pipeline in the market test that we have conducted, uh, we, we expect that we'll be able to go ahead with that, and obviously there are opportunities for uh, the companies in the countries north of Greece uh, to bring in uh, uh, cargos of uh, uh, LNG uh, before the gas from Azerbaijan starts uh, flowing in. Now, do we yes. Do we have any questions? Yes, we have a question over here on the left. Uh, when the microphone comes, can you kindly introduce yourself? Third row towards the end. Thank you very much. My name is Lubomir Kuchukov. I'm coming from Bulgaria, former Deputy Foreign Minister, now representing the Economic and International Relations Institute. Uh, half a year ago, I was, I was among the unhappy audience as far as the Buku project was concerned and the final decision was taken about that. But here I feel, to, to a certain extent, reassured that uh, Bulgaria could qualify it as a side dish to a main course, uh, speaking about uh, the transportation of gas to southeastern Europe. So my question is, at what stage exactly are the negotiations, and in terms of timing, how does this project, uh, how could this project proceed in the future? The, the questions about the project and how quickly it will proceed? Yeah, is with the, uh, southeastern Europe and uh, after the tap is already you're talking about IGB specifically? Yes. I, IGB is, is moving forward. Uh, there's commitment from all the participants in the consortium, including Bulgarian Energy Holding and uh, Edison. There's commitment from the governments and political support, significant political support for the project. So as I mentioned earlier, we're going to take an unconditional final investment decision by uh, summer of 2014, and we expect fair ga first gas by the beginning of 2016. And it's moving ahead. There are no issues or obstacles that, that we have in front of us. May, may I just, 
May I just add to that as well? Um, a couple of months ago, the Chardonnay's consortium signed a firm contract to deliver one BCMA of gas to Bulgaria. So that, um, that contract's firm. That depends on the, the pipeline that DEPA uh, describes here. I, I think it's, it's a tremendously important contract. It demonstrates the intent of Chardonnay's to bring further gas into Southeast Europe, and it owes its success to the Bulgarian government. Uh, and I'd also like to highlight the role that the European Commission and the United States government have played in encouraging the development of southern corridor gas into Southeast Europe. So I would see this as, as an appetizer rather than a side dish. Thank you. I have a, a question. Yes. This microphone behind you. My name is Niki Javela. I'm a member of the Energy Committee of the European Parliament. Um, my question is again about the FID, Mr. Tunglen. Um, I understand it's a big investment. The investors must be nervous somehow. How realistic are you about the date before uh, Christmas of concluding the FID? And the second question to Mr. Sahin is, the IGB inter interconnector, is it included in the projects of common, common interest that uh, the Commission approved recently, the IGB interconnector? Thank you. Well, Charles, you want to the first Yeah. The final investment decision that actually commits everybody in the entire value chain is made by the producer, Jacques Denis Consortium. And you heard the ambition um, that this will be made before Christmas. TAP has done what needs to be done as part of that process. All technical studies, all commercial arrangements, all agreements with governments involved are in place. With the support of the governments in Greece, Albania, and Italy, some of these agreements with and between governments are still awaiting ratification. The IGA in Italy and the host government agreement with Greece is awaiting ratification by Parliament in Greece. But I'm absolutely confident that with the support of these governments that these documents will be ratified before the final investment decision. And with that, TAP um, has ticked all the boxes and has submitted all the documentation that Shaktanese will need for their final investment decision. So I'm not in that position where I can say that that uh, FID will be made before Christmas. I will have to leave that with the producer, Mr. R. Cook. Uh, yes, indeed, uh, IGB uh, is a project of common interest for Europe, which means it has the full support of the European Union. Uh, that support, you can also see it because the European Union is also contributing 40 million euros uh, towards the 220 million euros of the project, and that's quite important. Uh, additionally, we're very close to completing the financing of the project, and we're working uh, very closely with uh, EBRD on that. So that's one of the other pieces of the puzzle that we're putting together so that we can take uh, the FID uh, by the summer of 2014. I think there's a, a point that can be made, which is that if you look at what BP and all the partners in the Chardonnay's Consortium and all the partners in the pipeline projects to carry SD2 gas to Europe, their concern, obviously, is monetizing the gas resources they actually have at present. What we don't know exactly is what extra additional gas sources there will be as and when the pipeline system is ready for use in 2019, 2020. 
also, we have then the prospect of a very different pipeline system within Southeast Europe itself. As a result of, I'm not sure if the microphone's working, we have a very different system in Europe itself as a result of the interconnectors that are being paid for by the European Commission largely that will expand the availability, the ability to take gas from the Southern Corridor and disperse elements into different countries in Southeastern Europe. So in other words, there's a fair prospect that by 2020, there will be both other sources of gas and other sources of dispersal, but all dependent on the main backbone that is the Southern Corridor. Um, we can't say exactly what this will be, and much of it, of course, will be determined by commercial considerations. But the ability for that <coughs> I think we can pretty much take for granted. Um, there must be some more questions coming from the floor. Yes. Uh, Tom Washington, Interfax. Uh, John, I think you mentioned this one, was that uh, the, the, the capex is huge and the, the, probably the greatest potential for making this money back will be later on as expansion occurs. Uh, the elephant in the room here is South Stream, which looks like the Russians are pushing ahead with it in whatever form it ends up in. Um, does this concern you? Harry, would you like to discuss the elephant in the room and the question of South Stream, which has not been raised so far? Can you repeat the question? The question is, what is the, how does one respond to the elephant in the room, which is South Stream? Uh, I think it's an interesting question that I wouldn't call it elephant in the room. All, all of us know that South Stream uh, is getting started to be built. I, I think the main question here is to see what exactly is going to happen to the balance of supply and demand in Europe. Uh, because one thing that uh, people generally ignore is that indigenous production in Europe, especially in the North Sea, is dropping substantially. So even with all the photovoltaics and uh, the wind power that is uh, going on stream, um, even uh, with the crisis in Europe. Uh, I believe that uh, when you look at 2020 to 2030, to that period, uh, the first 10 years of uh, Jacques Denis, uh, there is going to be a gap uh, of uh, gas in Europe. Uh, so Europe is going to have a gap of about 40 BCM, 20 to 40 BCM of gas, and that is after you consider Jacques Denis, after you consider Eastern Mediterranean, and, and you, you put all that together. Uh, so, another very interesting thing that uh, one needs to consider is uh, what Russia is going to do with its gas. Uh, at some point, sooner or later, uh, Russia is going to start selling significant quantities of gas to China. The question is how much uh, gas is it going to take out of Europe to push into China? And what will that balance uh, mean? Uh, for uh, what, what will that mean for the balance of supply and demand? What will that mean for prices? I think uh, what we may end up seeing is that there's going to be more gas availability and selection of gas sources in southeastern Europe uh, rather than in uh, northern Europe. Uh, but uh, you never know. Uh, I, I never try to predict how things will evolve. Uh, but South Stream is just in the end. A, a, a small component of these more major changes. We have uh, a question over here. Second row. Thank you. Olga Kumush. So I would like to point out the second elephant in the room, the Iran-Turkey-Europe gas pipeline. So we know that in July, Turkish government nationalized the bill giving the authority for nationalization of the territories along the Turkey-Iran-Europe gas pipeline. So I wonder, is it really a setback or is it, is it really a com concurrent project or such stream? Does anyone want to comment on the issue of Iranian gas coming to Europe through Turkey, which is the essence of your question? Uh, you, you can see from the um, enthusiasm with which the question has been greeted. 
Um, I, I would just simply say, as a moderator, um, anything could happen if the nuclear issue were to be resolved. What that means in terms of European gas supplies, in terms of global gas markets, who knows? But I would just make one little word of caution about Iran, which was that 10 years ago, there were very, very serious discussions on three, on four LNG projects in Iran. None of them got anywhere, even though at one point the Iranians said they were weeks, and on one day they said they were only days away from signing. The reason is it was difficult to do business with Iran on commercial grounds. That issue has still to be resolved even if the nuclear issue is to be resolved. So I'm not quite sure that resolving the nuclear issue automatically yields an immediate prospect for gas coming to Europe. Long term, obviously, but short term, I, I, I wouldn't, I, th I think there's a long way to go still. Um, the advantage of a moderator, which is that you can look up people in the audience. And we haven't had a pop-up comment on South Street. On the other hand, we do have in the audience a professional lawyer, and lawyers are supposed to be on top of their brief at only a few seconds' notice. So given that um, Alan Riley is chairing the panel on Eurasian intercontinental energy flows tomorrow and has done a certain modicus, modicum of work on South Stream, I wonder if you would like to comment on how South Stream fits into the um, Southern Gas Corridor issue. Can we have, I will come back to you in just a second. Can we have uh, a microphone go over here, please? Thank you very, thank you very much for that, for John. I was uh, actually discussing uh, Nord Stream just now, but um, we can talk about South Stream as well. Um, where do you start? Um, one of the questions is going to be is that um, if South Stream is uh, the political commitments seem to be in place and Gazprom seems to be very serious about delivering the, um, the pipeline, I think the 2015 perhaps is a bit of slippage, 2016, 2017, perhaps certainly by 2017 at the latest, uh, it looks like there will be a pipeline and the Russians will be delivering gas through that pipeline. Uh, and one of the really interesting questions about it, uh, and again, it's, at this stage, it's very difficult to work out how the resource flowing in that direction through, the, the, through that pipeline and hitting southeastern Europe, how it will affect the prospects for other gas, gas sources uh, and gas supply, or suppliers. And I think we'll only see that as this all comes forward. Now, one of the arguments is it's, 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 it's simply a diversionary pipeline, and therefore the contracts will flow, nothing will change very much. But I think you can't underestimate the impact of having the gas coming in from a different direction and the prospect of some of that supply having a spillover effect in the localities and places it's coming up. Some of it's already tied into some contracts in various parts of the region, but I think we'll see more of that as this becomes, if you like, more clearly concrete and more um, entities, more corporations and states uh, come into the flow. I think that's what we're looking at at the moment. I mean, having said all of that, all the questions around South Stream to remain, it's an extremely expensive project. Uh, we have to say that it probably ends up being, we're talking about what is the most expensive gas pipeline in the world. I mean, somebody referred to South Stream recently, the less is South Stream, more is Gold Stream in terms of the cost. Um, but we'll see. But as, as I say, it's, I think the, the, the effects of, of South Stream are somewhat unpredictable in all of this. And then also on, on top of this is all of the EU regulatory structure which is going to come in, into place. I doubt they're going to get any exemptions from the European Union, so there's going to be issues about how, how when it lands in EU territory, the EU capacity rules apply, uh, the network codes and the entire panoply of EU uh, energy regulations will apply to it. I think the Russians don't like that. That may cause some delay and cause some issues about who, who gets access and what. I don't know. I, there's lots of other issues I could talk about, but a, 
I'm just a kind of thumbnail sketch of some of the, of, of the questions. Is that, is that fine, or yes, do you want to ask me yes, something else? No. That is fine. You're, the bottom line is you think South Stream is going to go ahead in some form. The question is now, what sort of competition do you think that is going to pose uh, in commercial terms to gas flowing through the Southern Corridor? Shell, do you want to? I, it's never been quite clear to me whether South Stream will be delivering new gas to the market. Mm -hmm or whether it will be just the redirection of existing gas or gas already under contract. If it's redirection of gas already under contract, I don't see the big competitive uh, challenge. But if it's new gas coming to Europe or intended to come to Europe, I think we need to remember the importance of the Shaftonis having signed uh, sales agreements having carved out that necessary share of the market um, <clears throat> ahead of uh, Gazprom or South Stream doing so. I think that was well-timed uh, and sort of provides the security that the Southern Gas Corridor needs uh, to be realized. We have two questions over here, um, Dr. Coolidge uh, and Barchan. Uh, I'll take them both together and you take the question. Thank you. Uh, is this working? Yeah. Yep. Uh, Jennifer Coolidge, CMX. So this is addressed to any of the panelists. Uh, given the uh, decrease in gas demand across Europe of about 5 to 10 percent since 2009, we're currently at levels uh, around the same levels experienced in 2000, could you comment on uh, incremental supplies from Azerbaijan and indeed gas also from the Kurdistan region, how you expect that to be split between indeed Turkey's burgeoning market and an uncertain uh, European market? Thank you. In fact, uh, a, a little bit earlier I made some comments. Uh, if you look when those supplies come uh, to the market at uh, the uh, end of this decade, 2019 and uh, 2020, really look at what uh, happens to indigenous production in Europe. It's dropping very quickly. There is going to be a gap. There is going to be need for additional sources of gas. Okay? And even now that you see with uh, the crisis and with demand going down 10%, the prices have remained pretty stable. The prices have not gone down. So it's a good balance right now, but I think we'll need more gas rather than less. Uh, I'd build on that. I'd echo that. I think the, the story in Europe is one of broadly flat gas demand over, over a period of a decade. And that is overshadowed completely by the dramatic fall in domestic production, particularly from the UK and the Netherlands. Uh, I think you raise an interesting question, which is the role of Turkey uh, as both a transporter of gas and a consumer of gas. And in President Gould's opening comments today, he projected gas demand doubling over the next decade to 2023. And as we develop the Southern Corridor and as we develop pipelines into Europe, we have to be mindful of the need to provide Turkey with competitively priced supply as we seek also to transport gas through Turkey to Europe. We, we have a question here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Judy Dempsey, Carnegie, Europe. Um, I want Can to you speak up? Because yes. the microphones are weak. Is that better? Is that better? Judy Dempsey, Carnegie, Europe. Um, I'm based in Berlin. I want to pick up the point about the South Stream. Um, and there was a question raised whether it would actually divert gas or be extraditional gas. Nobody mentioned, uh, no, none of the panelists mentioned the role of Ukraine. Would they benefit in any way from this new supply of gas? Or are there any prospects of this, um, this whole back and forth between Gazprom and NAFTA gas, this whole transit arrangement? I mean, I'd like a, a bit of clarity on, on um, how Ukraine might benefit or not by, this, by, the, um, by the new corridor. Thank you. In effect, I think that's, that's almost two questions, which is what is the impact of South Stream on Ukraine and does South Stream benefit from the Southern Corridor? 
Um, would anyone like to take up on those points? <laughs> if, if, if there is more gas, if there is more gas in Central Europe, the gas could find its way back to the Ukraine. I th I was, Bach Bachan, you've got a question, but I was just going to say before, the more flexible the internal European system, the easier it is to supply Ukraine by pipeline from non-Russian pipeline sources. And that, of course, puts Russian gas, Gazprom gas, into a far more competitive position. It forces it to act in a far more competitive manner. Um, which sort of ends its um, or reduces its its ability to control um, a, a somewhat non-transparent system of uh, pricing with regard to supplies to Ukraine. Uh, Barchan. This is Barchan Yinan from Hurriyet Daily News. Um, I think this is by the end of the session. That's why I waited because I will be asking a question totally different than these technicalities, but rather on the political impact. Since um, we have Mr. Sakinis here, I was um, sort of curious um, about the impact this project is having on the Greek public opinion, since this is going to increase the interdependence between Turkey and Greece, which weren't exactly the, be the best of friends um, until uh, the 10 years ago. So I'm wondering whether this is having any, any impact in the public opinion as an asset for the um, you know, improvement of the Greek economy, or on the contrary, um, because of the rise of, uh, um, is it is it creating any reaction, or whether you have uh, whether your company has any sort of a PR um, strategy um, about it um, on explaining it to the um, public? Thank you. Um, first of all, let me make it clear that the relationship between uh, uh, Greece and Turkey is excellent. Uh, uh, let me also make clear that we have been getting gas from uh, Turkey, from Botas, uh, for many years right now, and uh, we have an excellent relationship with Botas at the corporate level. Uh, so all, all of that is working very well. So uh, as a member of the European Union, working with Turkey and working with Azerbaijan uh, within uh, the Southern Corridor, uh, you see uh, a, a great cooperation uh, that is uh, continuing. So that there's no issue and need for PR or anything like that. This, this is very natural. The important thing also, if you look at it uh, uh, from the point of Greece, uh, diversification of sources is extremely important. Uh, having a competitive portfolio is extremely important as well, the same way it is for Turkey. Uh, there's something common here for both Turkey and Greece, that if we have competitive sources of gas, we can have a more competitive economy, which is extremely important for both of our countries. We have a question here. Um. Thank you very much. Hasan Selim Özertem from International Strategic Research Organization, USAC. I'd like to ask a question about TANAP. TANAP will be designed for uh, transmitting 31 BCM of gas at the initial uh, building capacity. But uh, the uh, supplied gas from Shah Deniz is mentioned to be around 16 BCM, and there will be around 15 BCM deficit gas. Who will fill the remaining uh, deficit if there will be no extra gas uh, found from uh, Shah Deniz? Thank you very much. I think that's, uh, that, that's a key question, not just that applies to TANAP, but to also the, the other pipelines of the, the Southern Corridor. The South Caucasus pipeline is designed to have twice as much future capacity as it does today. The Trans-Adriatic pipeline similarly, uh, and I think um, the IGB pipeline is likely to be expandable from 3 to 5 BCMA in the future. So in essence, what the investors in these pipelines are doing is expressing their confidence that more gas will flow through the Southern Corridor over time. Certainly, BP in Azerbaijan is very confident that we will be developing future fields and would highlight the uh, giant Chardonnay's deep field in Azerbaijan and the giant ACG deep field in Azerbaijan as two of the fields that we'll be working on in, in the very near future. Um, beyond that, I, I would simply point out that a, a pipeline like TANAP links the world's largest source of gas 
in the Middle East and the Caspian to arguably the world's largest gas market in Europe. And that is what underpins our confidence that whatever the names of the fields that eventually come through that pipeline, uh, TANAP will be a pipeline that will be filled to capacity over the next few years. We have a question over here. Yes, my question is also for Al Cook. Um, uh, my name is Richard Norland. I'm the American ambassador in Georgia. Uh, and may I say, uh, uh, BP is well and ably represented there by Neil Dunn. Um, my question, uh, as a layman, um, I'm just wondering, drawing on your experience, what impact do you think the, uh, the Shock Denise project will have on Georgia, um, and both short-term and long-term? And, and are, you, are you satisfied with the linkages between Georgia and Azerbaijan uh, for, for when that project gets underway? Thank you. Al, do you want to answer? Certainly. Well, I think the first thing to say is that our experience of working in Georgia through the construction of the baku tbilisi jehan pipeline and the South Caucasus pipeline has turned into a very positive one. And our operations there are going extremely well at the moment. When you look at the Southern Corridor and ask the question, what does that bring to Georgia? I think the answer is a very positive one. Um, firstly, uh, we will be investing through the South Caucasus pipeline uh, around about uh, $2 billion into Georgia, which will be the largest foreign direct investment in the history of the, in the, in the, history of the country. Uh, when you look at the specifics, uh, they're equally important. Uh, two large new compressor stations which pump all this gas through the Southern Corridor over the South Caucasus Mountains and into Turkey. Uh, and these compressor stations are huge. Each one is the size of 50 soccer pitches. So these are giant investments in, in their own right. Um, in terms of your question as to the relationships between Azerbaijan and Georgia, um, again, we've seen very stable relationships over the last few years and um, are looking forward to the new Georgian government as it comes in in maintaining those. And um, our hope is that such is the benefit for Georgia of this direct investment and from the importance of Georgia as a transit country Within the, within the Southern Corridor, that that will continue. And I suppose the final thing I'd highlight is the important role that Chardonnay's plays as a provider of natural gas to the Georgian economy. And that will increase proportionately as the um, gas flows through the Southern Corridor, through the South Caucasus pipeline increase. So there's a tremendous dependence of the Southern Corridor and, and Georgia together, but also a tremendous mutual benefit. If you look at what the situation was in 1995, when you had both Georgia and Azerbaijan coming out of extensive civil turmoil, and you had them commit for the very first pipeline, the baku supsa line, and the idea and the concept of it, and you think how far we've come in the last 18 years, in look at the amount of traffic that is carried between Turkey and Georgia, between Georgia and Azerbaijan, the development of local industries that feed off and feed into the development of the energy corridor. It's been a transformation for Georgia as well as for Azerbaijan, and potentially, of course, increasingly for Turkey with TANAP. So I would presume that at least in commercial terms, the prospects for increased cooperation uh, uh, are, are, are continuing to intensify and grow. Um, I, I, I don't really see, in a, in a sense, um, any conceivable alternative because they are so now interdependent in a way that was just unimaginable less than two decades ago. Um, do we have any further questions in the hall? Yes, we have a question at the back. David O'Byrne. He gets priority. I used to work for his company. <laughs> Hi. Uh, David O'Byrne from Platt. Uh, we've been hearing a lot recently about the possibility of gas from northern Iraq being transited through Turkey, um, especially through, the, through the, the possibility of it um, being transited in the TANAP pipeline. Now, two weeks ago, a senior Turkish official was quoted as saying that if that happens, Turkey should be um, entitled to take a larger share 
in the, the TANAP consortium. I was wondering, is, is that a possibility? And if so, will it affect the uh, final investment decisions on TANAP and on the, the Shack Denis field? Do you want to take it? Certainly. Well, I think the first thing to say is that in broad terms, um, as we build oversized infrastructure and scalable infrastructure um, from the Caspian to Europe, one of the largest challenges we have is making that economic in the short term. And as such, the benefits of gas coming from other countries uh, through those pipelines to Europe are, are huge. And uh, given that all this gas pours into the, the 500 billion cubic meter a year uh, gas markets of Europe, the benefits of additional gas supply uh, far outweigh the disadvantages for us. As regards the participation levels in, in TANAP, I think one of the successes of TANAP under the leadership of SOCAR is the stable structure that's been created through the 80-20 split between Azerbaijan and Turkey. Um, SOCAR has offered 29% equity to a number of companies within the Chardonnay's consortium. Um, and that creates the opportunity for, for companies like BP to join TANAP. We're confident we will do so. Um, beyond that, um, undoubtedly, there could be changes in the shareholder structure uh, going forward. And, and uh, we don't regard them as set in stone. But what gives us confidence right now are the core strong shareholders coming into TANAP, which as well as ourselves obviously includes SOCAR, uh, in the majority, and also Botash. Now, do we have it, any, as I don't see any further urgent questions, we've got five minutes. That gives you a minute and a half each to sum up. Um, Shell, what would you like to make as your final comments? Yeah, well, I think I, uh, this discussion also has demonstrated how important it is to look at this as one value chain, one supply chain that needs to be tightly integrated. I think also this last point um, serves the need to underline that the heavy lifting is now to put in place the initial phase. But then all elements of the transportation chain can be expanded, like TAP can be uh, doubled in its capacity. But that can happen in small increments. The big increment is now, but expanding capacity can happen in smaller increments, which could allow for um, um, entering into a new supply sources and capturing pockets of demand in the market as and when they arise. Uh, <clears throat> but it all rests on the ability of this um, big partnership of being able to lift the first, make the first lifting to have the main, uh, main course going now. Thank you. It's interesting to look back and look at uh, how many years it took and how much effort it took uh, to start thinking about the fact that there is indeed going to be gas from the Caspian uh, in Europe. Uh, and I'm certain uh, the people here that uh, have worked uh, very much on this field feel very happy about it. Uh, but these projects are not easy. They uh, are very complex, they're very expensive, and they take a long time. Uh, and we're talking about this gas as if it is here today, but it won't even be here today. It will be here in 2019. Uh, so in effect, Europe will need more gas. There are going to be more projects, but I'm very happy to uh, be a participant uh, in uh, the purchasing of uh, the gas from Sakhdenis because for some time it is going to be the only gas from the Caspian that is going to be coming through to Europe. Well, I'd like to pick up on, on Harry's comments in particular. Uh, we have a five-year construction period ahead of us on the Southern Corridor and a lot can happen in that time. One thing we've learned from the previous five years is the support of the governments involved is essential. And we know that over the next five years, that is going to remain the case. And this is going to continue to be a partnership between countries 
and companies. I'd like to highlight three areas where we will look for continued support, uh, and perhaps start here in Turkey, where it's been the Turkish government working with the Azerbaijani government that has been fundamental to the development of the Trans-Anatolian pipeline system, and we'll need their support uh, through the final investment decision and on through the next five years. The second I'd like to highlight is the United States government, which has been fundamental to the development of Caspian Energy, um, even back into the 1990s with the development of the baku tbilisi jehan pipeline. Um, Secretary Moniz gave a very important interview to the Financial Times just a couple of days ago, underlining the importance that he attached to the United States' continuing role in supporting international energy security, and we'll need that role to continue uh, for the development of the Southern Corridor. And finally, the European Commission. The European Commission has played a, a huge role in the development of the Southern Corridor, and we would like to see that continue, both in terms of supporting the development of the pipelines we've already announced, but also in terms of supporting the development of interconnectors, small pipelines between countries within Southeastern Europe and beyond. Harry today mentioned the IGB pipeline, uh, Kietel mentioned the Ionic Adriatic pipeline. These are two pipelines that can really build us towards the next phase, and we would love to see the European Commission put the energy into pipelines like this, interconnectors within southeastern Europe, with the same energy that has supported the Southern Corridor for the last five years. Thank you. I want to thank the panelists, but before I do so, um, I actually want to take issue with them. Um, I, I, I really was very upset at the way in which uh, they described this as a meal that would have a starter, uh, a main course, and a dessert. Uh, this is a banquet. This is course upon course. They are the chefs producing and presenting the dishes. But it's Turkey that is giving us so much of the ambience, so much of the hospitality. So I simply want to say my thanks to all the hosts here, my thanks to the panelists very much for giving us such a good description and analysis of the projects that we've had going on. And to make just a, a couple of very basic household points, first of all, the next session on Iraq, overcoming barriers in Iraq, will start in this room uh, at 12 o'clock. The next is we are under strict instructions that we have to wear our credentials, our badges at all time, so clearly I'm in breach of um, uh, my contract. Uh, and lastly, please bring all your possessions with you, including your headset, when you leave the room. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>